We're here because you share an interest in the world's climate system, perhaps also like us here at the aquarium about the role of the oceans in that system. Understanding changes on a global scale, as you all know, is an enormously complex task. I was thinking of the fifth IPCC report that came out just a week or two ago, and it's continued to get clearer over the five renditions of that report, stating for the first time that, quote, the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Atmosphere and ocean have warmed. Amounts of snow and ice have diminished. Sea level has risen, unquote. That much is known and sounds elegantly simple, but documenting exactly what has happened in the past and what may happen in the future, and most importantly, why, is much more difficult. It's equal, equally challenging to try to explain what we know and what we don't know to the public and decision makers. That's why the John Carlson Lecture Series is so important and why we're del delighted now to collaborate each year. Indeed, we here at the Aquarium share a desire to raise the level of public understanding about climate science and global change. The Aquarium, for example, leads a nationwide collaboration now of 30 aquariums and zoos funded by the National Science Foundation and NOAA, working together to figure out, figure out how best to educate our visitors about this very important problem. And together, we, re we reach almost 30 or 40 million people a year, so it's a great opportunity. That effort, of course, must have a strong scientific foundation under it, which is why we are so grateful to the work done by the Lorenz Center and, again, the intention of the John Carlson Lecture Series to bring that work to the broader public. So I hope tonight's presentation will lead all of you to new discussions about global change with your colleagues, your family, and friends. By having such discussions, you too can help to share good information and raise awareness. I'm happy to be joined tonight by Kerry Emanuel, Cecil and Ida Green, Professor of Atmospheric Science, and Daniel Rothman, Professor of Geophysics, the co-founders of the Lorenz Center at MIT. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Dan. Thank you, bud. Welcome to the third annual John Carlson Lecture. This lecture is made possible by a generous gift from John Carlson. John Carlson's gift to MIT's Lorenz Center. I'd like to spend just a couple of moments um, remarking about two wonderful benefits of uh, John Carlson's gift. Um, first, which is quite obvious, I'm sure, to everyone in this room, it provides a way of communicating um, basic climate science to the general public. In doing so, the Carlson Lecture also honors the legacy of Ed Lorenz. Professor Lorenz is widely known as the father of chaos theory, which he discovered as part of his studies of the predictability of the weather. Such curiosity-driven research, performed in the context of an important practical problem, epitomizes the spirit of the Lorenz Center. Tonight's Carlson lecture, lecturer, John Wettlaufer, is professor of applicable mathematics at Oxford and professor of geophysics physics and applied mathematics at Yale. Now, now, that's a mouthful, um, but the reality is actually quite simple. Uh, John studies the physics of ice. Right? His work has helped explain problems ranging from why ice is slippery to how glaciers flow. In particular, the implications of his work for improving our understanding of climate has attracted much of his attention and that of his colleagues. One of the remarkable aspects of John's work is the way he combines field work in the Arctic laboratory experiments in his own lab, and mathematical theory. This interplay between theory and observation, so central to basic climate science, is, as you shall soon see, um, also one of the main and most intriguing features of his work. So without further ado, let us welcome John Wettlacher. Can everyone hear me? No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Kerry and Dan and John Carlson and the Aquarium and MIT 
for inviting me to help uh, celebrate the aspects and the legacy of, of Ed Lorenz by taking you on a kind of tour of my particular view of what we understand and what we don't understand, and why, and how it sort of fits into the pantheon of uh, physical sciences. Now, I don't often get a chance to stand in front of this big screen like this. Um, when we were in Stockholm last year, we used to go to the National History Museum and go to the IMAX theater all the time. And when my son finds out that I was standing here and didn't come out of the screen, uh, he's going to be sorely disappointed. Okay. And I'm going to have trouble sort of seeing where I'm going, but um, this is a picture of the way in which uh, people who do geochemistry try to understand the fluctuations in our past climate. I'm not going to dwell so much on this, but to say that there are proxies that allow one to look at the temperatures in the past climate. And this is uh, one of them showing you over well, the kinds of time scales that you're not used to sort of digesting, how the temperature has changed. And you can see um, on the right-hand side there is the temperature and uh, the past. And as you um, go from that side to this side, you go from then to now. And is there feedback? I think there's. Do you have the other mic? Can you try? It's off. It's off. Okay. Okay. So you see these wiggles, and you see uh, dramatic changes in the past climate record. And you see that ice in the southern hemisphere is a rather new entity on the time scale of um, 60 million years. And in the northern hemisphere, it's even uh, more of a recent phenomenon. So it's very clear that there have been serious changes in the past. And the question is, what's going to happen in the future? <laughs> yeah. So this is a very well-known physicist who uh, is um, accounted with making this statement. It's, it's certainly true. Um, and the answer is, of course, uh, we're not sure. So let's just delve into the, the, the issue of prediction. What's the nature of scientific prediction? And in fact, what is the nature of science? So of course, I don't know all of you people. I don't know how many of you decided that you would abandon the nature of science uh, in the past and never think about it again in the future, or whether you have a good idea of the nature of science and and or your particular view of what science is. So let's just start with that question. And we'll use um, one of the great teachers in my field, uh, Richard Feynman, who made this profound statement, which is true. Science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. And the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, but you're the easiest person to fool. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. But it's a deep statement that uh, there are things that just uh, are inviolable, and uh, and you you one of those is that you can't really deceive yourself, and this, the construct of science is is really essentially based on this idea. We could ask why we need it, and I'll I'll turn to something that's rather more uh, common for most people. How, how many people have a cell phone? Right. How many people are extremely annoyed when you don't have any bars? Right. How many people think it's their right to speak on their phone at any time, any place? Uh, okay, we'll stop there. <laughs> but you demand that the technology works all the time. You drive your car, 
Uh, you use your computer. You're very surprised when it crashes. And in fact, it's very rare that it really does, given the amount of time you use these things. Okay, so, so we often equate technology with with science, which is uh, they're obviously related. Um, we need science for repeatability. And repeatability is equal to safety. If you are old enough to remember the Challenger disaster. Um, I remember exactly where I was when it happened. Um, the question of what happened there had to do with uh, repeatability and safety and a scientific principle. And, and I refer again to uh, Feynman, who says a successful technology uh, requires that reality must take precedence over public relations because nature cannot be fooled. And he was asked to be involved in this uh, investigation. And his questions uh, were focused on scientific issues. What could have gone wrong? And as you may know, that the, the uh, O-rings for the solid rocket boosters uh, did not have a high enough thermal expansion coefficient. And uh, that was the origin of the problem. And, and he sort of demonstrated it here uh, when he did this experiment. And I put it nice warm, and I discovered that when you put some pressure on it for a while and then undo it, it maintains, it doesn't stretch back, it stays the same dimension. In other words, for a few seconds at least, more seconds, there's no resilience in this particular material when it's at a temperature of 32 degrees. I believe that has some significance. For our problem. Well, I mean, I, the, the echo was really part of the original <laughs> video. But you see what he did, right? I mean, he tested a very simple scientific principle and saw that, uh, that uh, there was no resilience in the O ring. So one might uh, generalize this uh, statement he made to you know, our problem for the successful understanding of climate reality must take precedence over. So it really is uh, true when we think about Ed Lorenz that real scientific advances are analogous to those in art. They're driven by human curiosity first, and not by anything having to do with uh, politics. People who are working hard on science are mostly interested in uh, trying to figure out what's going on. What is science not? It's not a producer of absolute and unassailable truth. It's not mere opinion, fundamentally a societal construct with no real objective basis. It's not that either. It's a tortuous process. There are recipes, even though you may have been led to believe that in high school. Uh, one makes incremental tests and tries to make progress towards repeatability. Now, uh, anyone who's uh, tried to figure out something knows that exactly what's, what, what this means. It's um, a, a difficult process, and it's best described by Feynman. When you <laughs> So most of the time, you're rather unhappy, actually, with this confusion. You can't penetrate this thing. Now, is it, the confusion is because we're also kind of apes, and we're just sort of working against them, trying to figure out the things together to reach the banana, and we can't quite make it, the idea. And I get that feeling all the time that I'm an ape trying to put it all together. I always feel stupid. Once in a while, though, every piece of the banana, the sticks go together on me, and I reach the banana. <laughs> Uh, any anyone who knows Feynman would would uh, be happy to uh, to have some of the sticks that he uses <laughs> being used. So 
so the idea of uh, when you get the two sticks together is really most re represented in scientific papers. Uh, all of the confusion uh, is usually not published, usually. What I tell my group is that if they go home less confused than when they came in, they're not doing their job. Okay, so what kind of science uh, do we do? And how do they bear on uh, the particular issues of, of climate science? Well, there are really two flavors. One is um, what I'll call laboratory science, in which we probe nature on our terms using controlled experiments. So just to give you an example, here's a picture of the advanced photon source at Argonne. Uh, you can see there's this big ring and those things down at the bottom of our cars. Okay, and there's a, um, this produces a synchrotron radiation and you can use that to probe the nature of matter uh, on your terms. This is Melissa Spanath, who I can tell you definitely probes nature on her terms. Um, she built this thing which is inside this box and then uh, Stephen Pepin uh, installed it right there where his hand is in this sort of simple looking apparatus um, <laughs> there in, through which uh, some uh, high energy x-rays uh, are brought in that hole in this little object there um, and my point only is to say that one takes data which this data doesn't really particularly matter except for if you look at the horizontal axis where it says scattering vector the the units are one over angstroms, right? so one ten thousandth of the diameter of your hair. So one can go and uh, probe nature on their own uh, terms, and that's the style of science which is uh, you may be familiar with. And but it's rather different than the sorts of things one might do in many areas of climate science. And the other flavor is is based on observations rather than experiments, if you will. And in that case, one probes nature on its own terms. And so we have sort of different lab coats. <laughs> the working day is constrained by various things. Um, I won't ask you whose hat you think is best. <laughs> the practical considerations differ rather more than those that one encounters in the laboratory environment. And so uh, you can imagine that people, when they have gone for some period of time under these conditions and have made observations, that they're pretty serious about not, you know, about every data point because it's sort of hard one um, material. But then you have some observations of nature on its terms, and the question is how do you simplify or unify a complicated system? How is it that one addresses geophysical scale issues in a meaningful manner with local observations? And this is a major challenge in this area. Okay, so now let's start to take a view from from the north, and you may have recognized this object. It's um, an artist rendition of the globe, uh, clearly a North American artist, um, in about June. And so you recognize uh, there's Greenland here, uh, and then this, it's hard to see because this doesn't really show up there. But you see the white cap at the top is the Arctic Ocean. And every year the Arctic Ocean freezes and a thin veneer, relatively thin veneer, persists perennially. It's about two and a half meters of ice. And it grows, it decays, it grows, it decays, it grows, it decays. We'll look at that in a moment. Its importance is multi- Fold. It's when it grows, it rejects salt into the ocean and drives circulations that couple to the global ocean. When it 
expands an area, it increases the albedo of the surface of the planet. The albedo is the reflectivity of radiation. And so white things have a much higher albedo and visible than do dark things. And so it's commonly said that the Arctic is a bellwether for Earth's climate system. Let's start to parse out why that's uh, actually discussed. Now I'm going to show you a movie here, sped up over six years. And so the color there is is this is a uh, looked at from satellite. It's the it's the microwave emission of the surface of the Arctic, but the color is the ice. You can see it uh, waxing and waning. That's the ocean freezing. And that ice that froze is then ablating every summer. And as far as we are aware, this has been going on for at least uh, several million years. So it's cold and it grows. It's warm in summer and it uh, melts back. And it's from the satellite era, from 1979 until now, this is the oscillation. It grows, it decays, it grows, it decays, it grows, it decays. And so I refer to it as an albedo oscillator. As the area of white stuff increases, then the area of reflectivity increases. And as it draws back, uh, the, the opposite occurs. So now let's parse out what this really means by a simple argument which appeals to your, your common experience. Right, so you're familiar with not touching the burner, especially those of you who have children. Don't touch that. And it's red hot. So as, the, as you heat up something, it radiates um, at a different color. Frequency. So it goes from red hot to uh, up to white hot. And you see that. The visible emission of the material as it's heated. Now, there's other parts of the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, that of course you don't see. You don't see the microwaves that are cooking your food. Um, you, you need a, a special way to look at the microwaves. Lately, there have been uh, energy audits. Has anyone had an energy audit of their house? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's free. Good. Um, so they may have come along with an infrared uh, camera. So all day long, the uh, sun's coming, uh, is out heating up your, your, the, the earth, and um, your house. Uh, when it's leaking heat, they can take a picture with an infrared camera. So you can't see that without um, a camera which is uh, tuned to a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so the Earth is doing that. The Earth is receiving the radiation um, from the sun, in the visible, and it's uh, emitting in the infrared. And you can see here, this sort of cartoon, shows that there's a separation in the temperature associated with this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the Earth system really at its core is driven by this uh, process. We get visible radiation from the sun. It heats up the planet as a system. Um, the system's re-radiating re -re this uh, energy um, in the infrared. Okay, so how do these things balance? So if you're not familiar with these things, radiation flows. You, know, you hear this, uh, it's flowing. If you put your hand by in, in front of a, uh, a hot computer, you feel something, thermal radiation. So it's just like the flow of liquid. So the flow of radiation you can think of in exactly the same way. Uh, I don't have much use for a gradient. Uh, boat, uh, this anymore. So I did this little experiment. Uh, you can see uh, we talk about what's called steady state. The flow in equals the flow out. 
when the system is in steady state. You know that because the level doesn't change. And you have a different flow in and a different flow out of it. If the same, then the level will never change. So long as I can stand there and hold this. So you can think about the Earth's system in a similar way, very crudely, that there's incoming radiation from the sun, and a fraction is reflected by the planet. That's the albedo, which we call alpha. Some fraction is reflected, and therefore, one minus that fraction is absorbed. So we can balance those two things, treating the planet as a big rock and when you do that, you get the following instructive result. The, the fourth power of the temperature of the Earth is proportional to the solar constant times this quantity here, 1 minus the albedo. So if the Earth was uh, uh, completely white, the albedo would be approaching 1 because all the invisible radiation would be reflected. And so you can see clearly as the albedo increases, 1 minus the albedo decreases, and so the temperature of the planet decreases. So the more white stuff you have covering the planet, um, the lower the temperature will be in this radiative balance. So that's the, the, the main message from such a, a simple uh, argument. And if you just put in numbers for what we roughly estimated the planetary albedo, then you get a temperature of about minus 15 Celsius or 5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty cool, even for Boston. <laughs> but it's pretty close, given the really crude estimate. I mean, it's not uh, 1,000, and it's not uh, a milli-degree. It's pretty close. Okay, so so what's, what's wrong with the artist's rendition Wow. All right, so, you know, the atmosphere, for a start, I mean, we can quibble about the artist. So. Okay, so the atmosphere. So if we go through the same argument and just crudely put a layer of the atmosphere, one layer of the atmosphere, and that atmosphere um, is going to absorb the outgoing infrared radiation and re-emit some of it back and re and emit some of it back to space. And so you know as when it's a cloudy day here, uh, it can be very warm, notwithstanding the humidity. Um, so if you just do that exercise, you find that the temperature of the surface increases by about 1.2 relative to the previous number. And so then one gets the value of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is of course warm too. But you see the, the qualitative trend. And of course the, 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 what a scientist would do is to start putting in more layers and start putting in more complexity and trying to figure out you know, what controls the temperature of uh, the surface of the Earth. But my point here really is that the albedo is a very important quantity and that the uh, albedo, if it increases, the planetary temperature decreases. And when we look in the polar regions, we can see this vernier of ice really playing an interesting role in that regard. You have uh, regions where, that are very reflective with high albedo, and you have the open ocean, which absorbs a great deal of radiation. So the albedo of the ocean is about 0.2, and the albedo of this ice is about 0.65. Okay, so this idea is invoked in what is called the ice albedo feedback. So you can imagine, you know, I've just drawn a, a cartoon uh, with the ice extent over there and an increased value of radiator forcing, you could imagine turning up the sun, for example. And the blue curve is the case where you, where you have a lot of ice, 
say, like we have today. And there's a lot of radiation being reflected. Now you can imagine warming the system and increasing the aerial fraction of water relative to ice. That will allow more radiation to be absorbed into the system, which will heat up the water, which will melt the ice. And eventually, one can um, theorize that there is a threshold beyond which the ice extent will drop from this value up here on the left to a low value. We call that a bifurcation point. It's, it's really um, something that people worry about. Now, practically speaking, whether the curve looks like the one on the left or the one on the right is probably not an issue for humankind, per se, but it's a scientific issue for us to understand what's the nature of the transition. Because uh, the one on the right is reversible. That is, if you re reduce the rate of forcing, you just increase the ice extent. Whereas this one requires you to go all the way back to where the dotted red line hits the lower blue line and then jump up. Okay. So you can see those transitions are, are qualitatively very different. And this is at the heart of, of the um, question about what's happening to sea ice in the Arctic. So you, you read about it all the time because you know, reporters have to say something's happening. Um, but this is why. You can, you can go to this uh, website, which is Cryosphere Today. Now, Bill Chapman has been, has been, has been um, archiving this data. And you can go and look at any day, look at your birthday, see what the ice cover was. Um, the ice grows, it decays, it grows, it decays, it grows, it decays, as, as we saw in the video. And what people are discussing is, will there be a point beyond which there will be no ice in the summer and only ice in the winter? We would call that seasonal that transition from perennial ice to seasonal ice. That is, there will be no ice at about late August and early September. And that's this transition that people are focused on. And now you see here, the dates are in the lower part. This is the first September of the satellite era. And at this minimum here, in September of 2007, many people say, well, there's some transition. Um, because it was the largest minimum, if you will, um, the smallest amount of ice in any September that had been recorded relative to the previous year, which was 2005, by about the area of, of Alaska plus California. So there's a, a major change in the, in, in the area, the extent of the ice. So now I'll flip to uh, moving September 2007 to the left, and we'll just go up through uh, September since then. So you see what happened in 2008, and then 2009. 2010, 11, 12. That one got a lot of press. And then just last year. Okay. So you might say, well, what does this have to do with the press of team? Um, I don't know. Um, how should we approach the problem? Basically, three scientific approaches one can take. To make observations, as I've discussed, there are two real types that are geophysically relevant. One is what, what I would call a low resolution paleoclimate data. That is, it's low, the very first figure I show, low wiggly lines, is very coarsely resolved in time. And the, the data I've just been showing you is daily. The, the satellite data, that's daily. So that's about the, as high a resolution as one can as one can get. One can run a model. Uh, I'm going to delve into this slightly uh, in, in a moment. Yeah, global climate models, have you heard of them? Mm -hmm. hear them? Yeah, you get complicated models. Um, and the kind of things that I do, which are based in, um, in a, the approach of theoretical physics, 
that are constrained by observations. So I claim that, that to understand the system, no, no one of these approaches is, is sufficient, and, and that all have different types of uncertainties. So this is the nearly the state of art uh, of the art of global climate models in predicting what happens uh, for the next you know, 100 years or so. So all of these on the right-hand side are the state of the art climate models. And that, that red curve there, the thick one, that's what the ice is doing. I think it's, it says something on its own. I don't need quite to say much of what this is is, is uh, an example of a prediction using these models. <coughs> Now, in some sense, you can, you can interpret the, the, the left-hand side as, a, as an error. And so you may realize that there's a substantial error or variability amongst the models. And since I'm focusing on Feynman, I'm going to start talking about our ability to, to think about uncertainty. And he espoused uh, this idea that um, it really is the essence of what we know, uh, is knowing and understanding the uncertainty. You know, so why do we struggle with uncertainty? It's an interesting question, right? <clears throat> Certainly, we all know in our common experience that there are types of un uncertainty that are acceptable, but others are not. So, for example, <laughs> you're okay. Uh, oh, yeah, the stock market dropped. It's up. Uh, up. But I want, I want a retirement. Okay. Um, I don't know, other examples. Um, you plan your vacation, do you plan your vacation based on the weather forecast in three months? Okay. Do you plan your vacation based on climate model prediction in 100 years? Well, okay. So clearly, I mean, living with uncertainty is very easy so long as it's your uncertainty, not mine. So let's start to peel back those things here. Here's a picture of, uh, of the atmosphere at about 10 kilometers, the moisture in the atmosphere. And uh, this is a really beautiful uh, movie. You could watch this for a long time. Um, it's The atmosphere is viewed as a fluid sitting on a rotating sphere. And we understand a great deal of the basic dynamics of the atmosphere. And trying to predict it in the sense of a weather forecast goes back now to Lewis Fried Richardson, who was the polymath, and he was the person who first conceived of numerical weather prediction, that is, solving the differential equations which describe the fluid in the atmosphere um, on a computer. But 